for joining today's webinar, Compliments of Value Selling Associates on Sales Team Dynamics. My name is Julie Thomas, and I'm the president of Value Selling Associates, and I'm going to be your guide through this content. I wanted to let you know a couple of things. Number one, uh, today's session is being recorded. Um, and number two, I will be happy to take any questions at the end of the session. So if you have them, let's go ahead and type them in. And uh, I appreciate you taking time out of a Friday as well as the end of the month to join us today. So let's get started. What is team selling? Well, more and more companies that value selling partners with are working with sales teams as opposed to solely sales individuals. And the whole purpose is to have a group of people, sometimes they're all within the company, sometimes they're within the company and partners, that have a common goal of increasing sales with a specific company in a specific region or in um, a specific um, industry. And why do they do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons that sales teams and set team selling is so important today. Number one, there's no question that the buyer is more savvy, more educated, and more demanding than ever. And as a matter of fact, our customers often have teams of people involved in the buying decision. So when we have a team of salespeople, it gives us the opportunity to bring a breadth of resource into that opportunity. Oftentimes in team selling, two plus one, or one plus one doesn't equal two, it equals three. Because collectively, two people, a minimum of two people, uh, will typically have greater insight, greater perspective um, than just one person who might be involved in an opportunity. When we have the right teams assembled, we can actually be more responsive to our customers because we have the right expertise involved on the front line with the customer. And that's important to the customers. And it also gives us the opportunity to build additional relationships with multiple people representing our organization to our clients the likelihood that we will have multiple personalities be able to develop deeper relationships is really important. And then one of the other benefits that I often see with uh, team selling initiatives is it really provides an organization, a selling team and a selling organization, opportunities for continuous learning. Because teams that are out engaging and interacting with customers can give each other coaching, can give each other perspective, can give each other guidance, and as a result, everybody on that team is continually getting better, learning and leveraging the expertise of each other, and it makes for a real learning approach or continuous improvement approach to selling. So let's talk about what that is. And I'm going to ask you to go into your chat right now and share with us what makes a good team. What do you think makes a good team? I know that as sales professionals, one of the challenges that we have as teams is often we have to manage without authority. We have to manage people and commandeer resources that are people that don't actually report to us. So I'm curious as to what some of your comments are. And I see things like leadership and cooperation and people with a common focus and a goal. Those are the types of things that make teams work well together. Communication, absolutely. Consistency, common goal. Common seems to be one of the, the key things that make a, a team good. Trust, honest communication collaborative nature, um, all very important and very, um, very critical to having a functional team that generates the results. So while that's all fine and good, let's spend some time and figure out, okay, how do we develop these teams in a way, what are the skills, what are some of the tools, and what are the processes we can use as sales professionals who may either be part of the team maybe managing a team, or maybe coordinating a team for the uh, purpose of generating incremental or growing revenue with a specific client. So well, let's 
get into it. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We've already touched a little bit of the current landscape, why teams and how they can help us. We're going to talk about how to make sure you have the right team. And the right team for one client may not be the right team for another client. So we'll give you some ideas on that. We're going to talk about the importance of establishing that common strategy and vision. When you are a sports team, or, or what a lot of us think of a traditional team, that's easy, because often that is set by the coach or the management of that team. But we have to often do that in a situation where, where we're coordinating resources on a team with people that don't report to us. So let's talk about that. And then how to coordinate and communicate. One of the things that we want to make sure doesn't happen is that um, we get the, the challenge where because there's three people involved in working with a customer, everybody assumes that somebody else is managing that process or following up on that um, conversation. Or worse, not just assuming that, not acknowledging that that's my role. So if I'm working with a team and I say, you know, it's not my job to call the customer and follow up on that particular que question that needs to be answered. If everybody on the team takes that perspective, and I've seen that happen, then guess what? No one's calling on the customer. And, and we want to make sure we've got coordination, communication, and to a certain extent accountability with the team. And then we want to talk about <coughs> how we can continually grow and improve our teams and look at the results, how we're going to measure that success in, in a framework for that. And then we'll go into questions. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say and some of your comments or suggestions as we go through this. So great. So you know what is going on? At the end of the day, we have clients that are, are globalized. Um, I'm sitting here today in San Diego, and I have customers in China, in Africa, in um, virtually every continent of the world, with the exception of I'm not sure we're doing any work today in Antarctica. But we have to be able to meet those customers where we are. And so we are often here at Value Selling commandeering localized resources to provide consistent global support. And the customer demands that. They don't want to pay for people flying on planes. They don't want to wait till the one expert or the one point of contact that they have um, is available. And we, as, as sales reps, we want to minimize the fact that we have a single point of failure anywhere in the sales cycle. For many of you, and looking at who's, who's joined us today, you sell complex solutions for complex problems in dynamic industries. And there is a lot of expertise that's required. And often it is unrealistic for us to expect that a single individual will have all of that expertise. So we have to bring collections of people together with complementary expertise to demonstrate that credibility for our clients. And and we are finding that today, more and more sales forces need to work efficiently, and they need to be leveraged. Almost every customer that we work with in the B2B space also has a partner strategy and the channel strategy. And those partners and channels are extensions of the sales team, and they choose those partners and channels based on some level of expertise that the partner or channel has. Maybe it's an industry expertise. Maybe it's a regional expertise. Maybe it's credibility in a specific account that we can partner with and cooperate with as, and collaborate with as opposed to compete with. So often these things happen without a directive from management in terms of building these teams. But in some cases, they are a little more formal and working with that directive manager. So as we look at these principles of team selling, we're going to be talking about the principles for the person who's responsible for coordinating that team. 
if you are an account manager or a territory manager or a channel partner manager, you are likely responsible for commandeering the resources within your organization that you can bring to bear in an opportunity or a customer as you manage that ongoing relationship. And the first job of that account manager or that team leader, whatever your role is, whether it's defined or it's a little more informal, is being the authority to call the plays. That means in sales, setting the strategy, communicating the vision, and having the ability to know what and where that team is going together. And, um, and that is the first role for the, this team leader. And so what does that mean? It means that often you are perceived by the customer to be the primary contact. Years ago, I heard uh, an executive in the technology industry say uh, for their sales organization where they had a number of specialists by product and by industry and, and the sales reps uh, they had multiple sales reps calling on the same um, customers, and some of the customers were really frustrated because they didn't know who to call when. So what would happen? Maybe they'd call everybody, and there was a complete drain on productivity because you had 10 people trying to solve the same problem, or maybe they called nobody because they were frustrated and didn't know what to do, and so the problem never got addressed. Either scenario is bad if you're leading that organization. So this particular executive uh, stood up at one point and said, all of our customers deserve to have one throat to choke, one person to call that is responsible and accountable for managing the entire relationship. So I don't have to figure out which of the 10 people that are on the team I have to call. So if you're that primary contact, it's also your job to develop and execute the overall strategy. Communicating that strategy is a part of this, and we're going to talk about that, but developing the strategy is critical as well. We often work with teams of people that are led by an account manager or a team leader to develop that strategy and get everybody on the same page. Because just as if I'm developing a strategy for my direct reports, if I can involve all of the people that have to participate in that strategy, um, the likelihood that they will own and willingly execute that strategy is harder, is, is much improved. So we want to, while we are responsible for developing it, often we want to collaborate and include that and include them. And then coordinate the resources, assign priorities, identify what resources are needed, how they're going to get sourced, and some of those types of things. Lead the initiatives, identify the opportunities that we're going after, and lead the initiative to, to advance and close those opportunities. Lead the initiatives to deepen and strengthen the long-term relationship of that client. Um, and that could be anything. That could be local contacts in the various global regions. That could be deep industry experts or what some of you that are on the line have in your organization, maybe product specialists or industry specialists that you bring in to do that. And then provide feedback. Communicate back to the team how things are doing. Maybe that's a report, maybe it's some other way that you're going to monitor the progress and communicate the impact of the effort, the work, and the coordinated strategy as it unfolds with the customer. <clears throat> so let's talk about who's on the team. I mentioned earlier, we think that each team has to be considered to who are the right people for this particular customer. Um, our teams may or may not um, be the same for every single customer, every single relationship, or every single opportunity that we're working on. What we talk about is who is on the team that can add value to the customer. So that could be an executive in your organization. Many sales teams include uh, in their team an executive sponsor. Now that executive may not be involved in the day-to-day 
um, operation of the sales strategy, but they might be involved in building a strong, solid, peer-to-peer -peer executive relationship. For some of you, you may find yourself in a situation where you are directing and managing to a certain extent and communicating with a C-level executive in your company to commandeer that team that you're working with. And then who are the contacts on your customer side and the appropriate people to have on that? That might be a global reach and, and, uh, or it might be more of a local reach with different levels of expertise. And then do you need some deep technical expertise on your team? For many of you, you sell technical solutions. You work with sales engineers. You partner with pre-sales consultants or post-sales implementation specialists or customer support or customer, I, I just talked with a cl uh, client yesterday who is building this whole new organization called the Customer Success Organization and it encompasses implementation and consulting and all of those people that are uh, responsible for making sure that their customers, once they do business with them, are as successful with their partnership as possible. So who are those people? And look, the way we like to create these teams is look at what the prospect's needs are, the people in the prospect organization that are involved in the relationship or the purchasing decision, and then map the appropriate resources from your organization that can add value to the prospect's team. <clears throat> then we have to start to look at the people themselves. People buy from people. And building relationships is important for everybody on that team. So we want to be very careful about the personalities and the relationships that we are fostering with our team selling. We also don't want to build teams that have um, that are um, uh, less diverse, where everybody comes to the team with the same exact skill set. We want to pick those team members that come to the table with unique capabilities so they can add value in unique ways um, collectively to the organization. In some situations, we need to align personalities and make sure that we are matching the appropriate personalities to maximize our probability of successful relationship. We are likely not going to change the personalities of our customers, and we're not going to change the personalities of the people we work with, but we want to identify the personalities and try to match and match make as best we can the appropriate personalities to move forward with that. And last but not least, and I mentioned this earlier, we want to match the level or the role wherever possible on that team. So recently I was working with a team from a large technology company that was all focused on selling, um, developing a relationship with, with a very large retailer. And they had a number of people on the, t the team. They had geographic dispersion of people that could build relationships with the very, in the various geographies where this large retailer had large sites and installations with decision makers and likely would be installing their technology. They had somebody on the team um, from a sales engineer perspective who had deep technical expertise in being able to design and tailor the application and the technology to this particular customer's needs. They had an executive on the team who was building a relationship with the executive at the retailer from an, uh, they called it an executive sponsor program. And that person was um, on that team. And that executive, when we spent the day doing the, um, building the plan uh, for that customer, that executive sat in the room and participated in that entire planning process which was, I think, a huge demonstration of the commitment that they had. We had some industry expertise in that. And they had a number of other different types of uh, roles and expertise of the people, from people very senior in the organization to very technical um, individual contributors. And the team 
was extremely successful because of the breadth of the resources they put in that. And when I say successful, they overachieved the revenue goals that they were expecting to deliver in this particular account in the time period they were looking at. What's one of the things that they did? Well, they established a common vision. We talked at the beginning, many of you put on there, that communication was key. Well, communication is key, but having a common vision. If you're a, a, a football team in the United States, the common vision is we want to score every time we have the ball. And ideally, we're scoring seven points, not three. If I'm, um, I want to make sure everybody is focused on that same goal. And somebody's got to set those expectations. Um, we want those to be clear and one of the challenges with communication and setting expectations is that often the person that's doing the communicating thinks they've communicated the message. One of the biggest fallacies that has to do with communication is the fact that it actually took place. And I can think of a number of examples where, well, wait, that memo went out that message went out, that presentation went out, and it was clear at the sales meeting that this was what our objective was. And three, six, nine months later, everybody says, yeah, but I thought maybe it changed, or yeah, but I forgot about that. Or they never read the memo to begin with. So making sure that we're not only doing this once, but doing this continually. Describe those goals in terms of the customer's success. Remember, all these teams are assembled to help our customers improve their business with a relationship with our organization. So rather than set those goals in terms of our success, we want to sell a million dollars to this company in the next six months, think about those goals in terms of what we're going to do to address the customer's key business issues and the problems we're going to solve with them that will drive their positive business results. When we start communicating those goals in the customer's terms, it'll make it much easier for the entire team to have that common goal with how we're going to impact the customer. Often we know we have to lead without authority. It's often a challenge to make sure that the team is as functional as possible because they don't work for us. We can't tell them what to do, or maybe we can tell them what to do, but we can't always expect them to do it. So how do we lead without authority? How do we dis demonstrate our credibility? How do we get buy-in from everybody to participate, cooperate, collaborate, and execute? Part of that is how we're going to create the strategy. Ownership is empowering. What we mean by that is let's get everybody creating the strategy together, even though you're the leader in directing that. People tend to want to be involved and are likely more willing to execute something that they created than something that was handed to them. So get them involved from that perspective. Build consensus. Um, sometimes that means negotiating and compromising within the team because people are coming at it with diverse perspectives. And what that allows us to do is facilitate growing the business plan not dictating how to grow the business plan. Uh, part of this communication is making sure that every single person on the team understands the role and responsibility. I was just working on a, a situation with a sales rep that we had two people working together on a renewal. And I talked with them both individually, and they thought the other person was responsible for getting it done. And there was no clear role and responsibility between the two of them. Their manager thought it was clear, but neither one of them took responsibility, accountability. As a matter of fact, a couple of them, each of them was kind of saying, hey, that's the other guy's responsibility. I don't want to get involved with that one. That could get ugly. That could get complicated. Well, let the other guy do that. So because there was a lack of definition and buy-in to the roles and responsibilities, none of the responsibilities were getting done by either role. So we want to avoid that. 
the bigger the team, the more complex that can be and the more important it is, critical it is for everybody to understand what their role is and what is expected of them. And they agree to that. And why? Remember that situation I talked about before where the, the CEO said, we have 10 people calling on the same account? He had example after example of the customer actually calling 10 people with the same problem. People were getting back to them. A, people were doing the same thing again and again. That's a waste of productivity. But if you had 10 people coming back with an answer in certain situations, you had 10 different answers. <laughs> so it also um, diminished the credibility of that customer, of that supplier in that customer's mind in a couple of areas. And we want to eliminate that confusion, both within the team and most importantly for our customer. We want our customer to be very clear. Hey, I call Julie when it's this type of a problem. I call Sue when it's this type of a problem. And, and if I can't get a hold of them, maybe here's the backup. But we want that clear line of communication open for our prospects. Then, once we've got the, the common vision, we've got the team assembled, we've assigned those roles and responsibilities, we need a common language to communicate and a common approach that everybody understands in how to engage those customers. We don't want inconsistency in how our how we're creating need with our prospects, developing the value of our solutions, and working those plans, if you will, for the customer to prove the concept and make a decision to do business with us. Common approach, common language. That often means that we're having ongoing communication. When I was a global account manager, we had regular meetings with my counterparts in Europe, my counterparts in Asia, um, and I was working in North America about who are you calling on, what have you learned, what has changed in the organization, who should we be targeting, and we were constantly discussing the various opportunities. So we were on the same page. So that if my contact in North America traveled to London and happened to be in a meeting with my counterpart in the UK, he knew exactly the types of conversations I'd have, the exact opportunities we were working on, where we were, and how he could add value in that conversation. It'll improve our ability to forecast. It'll improve our ability to know how to allocate resources. So you have to look at your own organization. How do you do that? Do you have templates? Do you have forms? Do you use some sort of a collaborative application? How do you keep that communication up to speed, current, and how do we make sure everybody is looking at that information on a regular basis? We also want to identify what is the appropriate way to escalate when issues arise. And issues will always arise, whether they're you know unintended or created by something that, uh, that happened inadvertently. How do we escalate that? How do we resolve that? And whose responsibility is that? So these are all the things that we talked about, common vision, getting the right team, making sure that right team knows their job. Um, back to the, the American football um, analogy, you don't need 12 quarterbacks on the field at the same time. Everybody's got a job, everybody's got a unique talent and skill set, and the best teams are the ones that have the best people in each position to leverage that success. But let's assume we've got the strategy, we've built the team, we've communicated and collaborated on the strategy, we're communicating the vision. As a matter of fact, we're over-communicating the vision. We're communicating it again and again and again. We're, we're confirming roles and responsibilities. We're getting buy-in to who's doing what and making sure that that's clear and holding people accountable. Now, how do we know that it's actually generating the results that we want? 
for many of you that are developing these teams, the, the actual revenue target may not be short term, it may be longer term because the bigger the deal, the harder they fall, as they say. It'll take longer often to close them. So what are our interim benchmarks and results? How do we make our team better? <clears throat> How do we know if our team is effective as possible or if our strategy needs to be adjusted? Well, we have to set up a framework to evaluate what's going on so that we can determine whether or not our strategy is actually going to get us the results that we expect and our customer the, re the results that they expect. And so the best teams are also agile. They have the ability to measure where they're at and then make changes in real time when they realize that something isn't working. So here are some ideas on how you can do that with your team. Well, have regular status updates. Somehow figure out a way to communicate regularly. Identify the best practices and the best methods to manage that communication. Sometimes you're dealing with multiple time zones and multiple languages um, and challenges. So identify those barriers to communication and find ways to mitigate them. Follow up. As the quarterback or the account manager and the person who's responsible for the overall results, make sure that all of those communications are followed up on. The commitments are followed up on and people are held accountable for results. The account plan can be updated regularly. And more and more of you I know are moving account plans from paper to online, to collaborative living documents that direct and, di and, and, and derive the behaviors that the team is going to prioritize around. So make that a living account plan. Our customers are not static. The industries that they live in aren't static. And each of us gets insight every time we discuss anything with our prospect that help, can help the entire team get better. And then recognize, recognize, recognize. Recognize the little things. Celebrate the success of that team, what goes well, what you were able to accomplish. And, and certainly we want to celebrate the business results, but we also want to celebrate the means to the end, how the team is evolving, how we're getting better, how we're learning, how we're deepening our relationships. So just as a uh, recap, and please, uh, should you have any questions, Please put them in and I'll address as many as I can as we go through this. You know, think about the successful teams that you've been a part of. Who is the manager for that team? Who is the coordinator and held accountable for how that team goes? But make sure that if that's your role, that you hold yourself accountable for those team results. Focus the team around the customer's needs and then identify the, the, the right team members to be on that as best you can. And be prepared that you may need to make changes, that you may learn that what you thought was the appropriate resource really isn't needed for whatever reason. Um, and as you create those teams, communicate clear roles and responsibilities and get those buy-in. Um, and then evaluate and celebrate. It's a pretty um, common sense approach to team management and team selling, yet some of these are nuances that are not common practice. We throw everybody in a conference room and then spend a couple hours saying here's what we're going to do and then go out and do it and the, the coordination ends the moment everybody leaves the room. So we want to really get deliberate and continuous in our team deployment, our team management. So what do I suggest you do to get started? Well, if you're a team leader or an account manager or part of a team, look at that team and the approach. Review them. How is the team dynamic going? What is the strategy? Is it communicated? Could everybody on that team describe it? Do you have a vehicle for communication? 
maybe the simplest thing is to start and make sure, you know what, it's time we start having some regular communication updates. Or maybe we need to spend some time and really get, get creative and collaborative and develop a better, clearer, well-defined vision of our strategy going forward. But whatever it is, decide what you could do differently to make that team better. And every participant on any team, whether you're the team leader or not, can contribute to growing the positive dynamics of that team and the positive impact of that team. And then think of the principles that we just talked about and how can you leverage them with your team to drive incremental business. Again, not rocket science, but like anything, takes discipline, takes focus, collaboration, and communication. So some really good things to think about as we go through this team. So, so I'm going to uh, op go into the questions here and happy to share with you a question, um, answer a few questions. As we um, address the questions, let me also show you, put up here exactly where you can get these slides if they get, as they get down. I've got a, a couple comments here. Um, uh, here's one. So, so the key is collaboration, cooperation, and common goals. I absolutely think those are three keys to an effective team. Collaboration. Everybody participates and contributes and therefore owns the the, uh, the strategy of that team, cooperating. We want our teams to be functional. We want us to work together as opposed to work against each other. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure there is a um, common goal. Is there a certain amount of psychology involved in team building? Probably. Uh, certain personalities and a balance of that. I believe that diverse teams are the most effective teams. So I don't want a team of 10 people that have the same background, the same perspective, the same expertise. But if I'm building diverse teams, I probably have to work harder at making sure that they understand the commonality of their perspective and are focused on a co common goal. Dysfunctional teams arise when you've got factions of a team or individuals on a team that don't even agree on the goal. They don't agree on how we're going to achieve that goal. Um, and we want agreement on that, even though we might not, we may contribute differently to the how we're going to get there, we certainly want agreement on what those goals are. Um, but that said, I don't think you need to be a psychologist to build a great team. What about integrity? Well, in business, integrity is everything. Everything we do is about crust and credibility and believability and honesty. And if you don't have integrity, um, you don't have anything. So um, thank you for joining us today. Let me share with you as we go into the uh, June time frame, uh, our next webinar will be mid-June, um, and we're going to be talking about developing a champion within an opportunity or an organization to seal the deal. What is a champion? How do we de develop them? And how do we leverage them to win? And uh, look forward to having you join us on June 18th. We'll be sending out the invitation and the link for you to register to that shortly. Um, so we've talked to any questions. If any question that you have was not addressed, please let me know. Uh, and please join us on uh, LinkedIn. I've got uh, one of my colleagues' associates' uh, LinkedIn address here, but please find me on LinkedIn or find David or anybody from Value Selling. Join the group. Go to our uh, Facebook page, Value Selling Associates. Like us. Leave us a comment on today's webinar, and we appreciate your loyal support. Have a good day, and remember,